People living along the tsunami-battered coasts of South India are rebuilding their lives, livelihoods and habitat after the 2004 tsunami. It's the story of people living on the edges of the map. The disasters are repeatedly hurting and affecting mostly those who are already marginalized. They are again, they are again the sections who have a least voice in our political platforms. That's one of the reasons why their concerns, their issues, their culture and their knowledge do not get into the mainstream education curriculum and mainstream political debates, mainstream academic debates also. Therefore, as a society, as a citizen, nobody has adequate understanding of the people around them. Most NGOs who carried out disaster programs in Tamil Nadu after the tsunami had not an iota of experience or capacity to even comprehend or understand the enormity of the disaster. The result being that it was each day piecemeal adding on to whatever they were doing and through that process creating a bigger disaster. In many cases, the rights of the disaster affected people were not respected. Tamil Nadu government very ambitiously gave uh, uh, instructions to most of the NGOs that all the affected communities should be in temporary shelters before Pongal, which is 14th January. Over uh, uh, lack, families have to be shifted to temporary transit shelters within 15 days to, process, to be processed. That was a very good idea, but that comes from lack of experience, that it is not practically not possible to create so many temporary shelters. The basic shelter rights of the disaster affected were often undermined. What we have seen was so many temporary shelters constructed without basic amenities violating all fundamental norms of a shelter. People have undergone a tra traumatic experience during the past three years by living in such uh, hill-constructed temporary shelters without having adequate facilities for toilets, adequate facilities for cooking, space for women in terms of privacy and other needs, and adequate space for sleeping. Many temporary shelters collapsed in several places. It caught fire in few places. And again, they constructed with the hopeless materials, without having a vision that these temporary shelters are going to last for three years or more. You cannot use tin sheets in places which are prone to cyclone and heavy winds because it can fly and it can rip off people. This is the first thing to remember. And the second thing, plastic sheets are not advisable because they are highly inflammable, they, are, they don't last for a longer period, and it causes quite a lot of difficulties for people. So these are some of the basic things to remember when we talk about roofs. There was an invisible pressure from the political class of the government to buy certain material from certain quarters. And everybody knows the reason. And uh, which definitely went against the standards that we have committed for. Without taking the consideration of temperature, rainfall, the materials used are like to bake people in an oven. I would agree with you that uh, when you say that uh, the shelters are temporary, we should not expect them to last beyond uh, at most a year. If it is up to a year, I think uh, it is uh, okay. This was one uh, important lesson we learnt in this uh, tsunami reconstruction program. So we need to give them the houses as quickly as possible. The rights of the disaster affected people to compensation and proper rehabilitation are enshrined as the right to life in international covenants such as the Civil and Political Convention of the UN and Article 21 of the Constitution of India. The standards are essential to meet those rights like the right to dignity, right to proper nourishment, right to space, right to uh, uh, the cultural uh, this thing. All those things are essentially enshrined in the standards that we have adapted and we try, try to strive for. So if we don't meet standards, which means we actually have violated the rights. If we meet the standards, we have respected the rights. 
the Supreme Court of India has reaffirmed time after time that the right to life actually means a right to dignified human existence, including shelter, livelihood, food, clean water, and access to health facilities and education. Our Supreme Court has explained housing means every amenity in the house. Housing means requiring your adequate deeds. The main issue is violation of human rights. Now, what are the human rights that have been violated? Essentially, this comes here. Denial of right to house and right to shelter. It was not necessarily deliberate acts or negligence that caused the problem. There were serious limitations. The knowledge of standards has not percolated down in humanitarian agencies. If somebody has a knowledge, someone else implements. Somebody who gains the knowledge would like to go up the ladder and work somewhere else. Do not really want to work on the ground. We don't have to wait for a disaster because after disaster you cannot, you can hardly have a time to teach all these things. We had to recruit a lot of new people for this response and uh, most of them did not have prior background of humanitarian response. So we went with so many staff who did not know what the standards were. Public hearings on the rehabilitation process have brought to focus a series of issues such as incomplete rehabilitation and lack of adherence to standards. <laughs> The government admits there were issues, but insists that rehabilitation was on track on the whole. Initially, we thought that about 1,30,000 houses had to be built. And these included partially damaged as well as fully reconstructed houses. We repaired about 11,700 houses, mostly done by the NGOs. And we have taken up the reconstruction of about 53,000 houses. Out of these 53,000, uh, about 70% of the houses are completed. The rest of the houses, we expect them to be completed in about three to four months' time. But there were serious issues concerning rehabilitation, as people note. <laughs> The enumeration has not been uh, sufficient enough to identify who needs and who does not need the house and the figures kept changing. The survey of the beneficiaries was not conducted appropriately. It was conducted in a half assured manner by the revenue department and the INGOs and other NGOs involved in the housing totally surrendered to the district administration. A study by the Voices from the Margins has found thousands of excluded families in coastal villages. Every village you can find 80 families excluded, 60 families excluded, 100 families excluded. Even if one person is remaining without shelter, it's a human rights issue. People in many places have complained that the government has left them out completely. Nobody on ground seems to know what exactly the government plans are. Everybody 
பெரியவங்களா அவங்களா பேசிக்கிறாங்க அவங்களுக்கு தெரிஞ்சவங்களுக்காக இவ்வளோ மெசேஜ் சொல்கிறாங்க தவிர நாங்கள் இருக்கிறோம் நாங்கள் கஷ்டப்படுறோம் எங்களுக்கு தான் ஆக்சுவலி ஃபுல்லாக எங்களுக்கு தெரியணும் எங்களுக்கு ரைட்ஸும் அது ஆனால் எங்கள் ரைட்ஸ் படி எங்களுக்கு எந்த விஷயமும் தெரிய மாட்டேங்குது அவங்களுக்குள்ளே பேசி அவங்களுக்கு முடிவாகுதான்னு பார்க்குறாங்க அவங்களுக்கு முடிவு சரியில்லைன்னா அதை அப்படியே ட்ராப் பண்ணிடுறாங்களே தவிர எங்ககிட்ட ரீசன் கேட்கணும் Still, the government is pushing its rehabilitation agenda vigorously, sometimes with tragic results. It is slightly in the range of 11,000 to 12,000 excluded families are there. Plus, those families who have not got permanent housing because of the delay in the construction process. We have three or four years ago. We have to go to the house and 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 go to the house. We have to go to the house and go to the house and go to the house and go to the house. அதில் வந்து பாதிக்கப்பட்டவங்கள வந்து கண்ணீர் விட்டு அதில் வந்து நீ வந்து பங்கெடுத்துக்கல நீ செய்ய நினச்சினா நீ இருக்கவும் முடியாது அது வந்து எந்த சபையில் சொல்லக்கூடாது எல்லா சபையிலும் சொல்லியாச்சு அது உடனே ஒரு செல் அடிப்பாங்க ஒரு ஃபோன் அடிப்பாங்க எங்களை தேடி வரவங்கள உடனே அங்கே மறைச்சி அங்கே பேசி எனக்கு முடிச்சுக்கிறாங்க The family of Palanivel and Muniamma was living in a temporary shelter in Kannampatti village of Nagapatnam. They were forced to move out without an alternative as the owner of the land came with the police and officials to evict them. Desperate Palanivel threatened to commit suicide if his shelter was dismantled and he poured kerosene in front of the demolition squad and burnt himself to death. அங்கே சொன்னால் சார் எங்களுக்கு வீடு இல்லாமல் நாங்கள் டோக்கன் எடுத்துகிட்டு எங்கே சார் போய் இருக்க முடியும் எங்களுக்கு நீங்கள் சாய் கொடுத்த மாதிரி நாங்கள் போய் இருக்கிறோம் அது வரலையும் எங்களுக்கு டெண்டில் கொடுக்கணும்னு சொல்லி அதெல்லாம் கொடுக்க முடியாது உடனே நீங்கள் காலி பண்ணால் காலி பண்ணி அஞ்சு ஆறு மணிக்கெலாம் காலைல காலி பண்ணணும் நைட்டில் ஏழு மணிக்கு வந்து சொல்லிட்டு போனாங்க கலெக்டர் சப் கலெக்டர் கந்தசாமி ஆடிவோ மற்றவங்க அங்கே உள்ளவங்க அத்தனை பேர் வந்தாங்க போலீஸ்காரங்க கூட வந்தாங்க நான் போய் அங்கே போய் டெண்டு தான் கேட்க போனேன் சரி காலைல காலி பண்ண சொல்கிறாங்களே எங்கேயாவது டெண்டை கேட்போம் அப்படின்னு எங்கள் வீட்டுக்காரங்க வந்திருக்கிறாங்க அங்கே டெண்டு பிரித்து அவங்க சொல்லியிருக்காங்க உங்கள் டெண்டை தான் இங்கே தனியாக இருக்குது நீங்கள் காலையே பிரிச்சிடணும் இல்லைனாக்கா நாங்களே இடித்து தள்ளிவிடுவோம் அப்படி ஜாமெல்லாம் எழுதி வெளியே போட்டுருவோம் அப்படின்னு சொல்லியிருக்காங்க வந்துருக்காங்க இந்த பிள்ளைங்களாம் அங்கே ரோட்டில் நின்று நின்றுட்டு இருந்துருக்குது இப்படி கொம்பெல்லாம் அழைச்சிட்டு போய் நாங்கள் எங்கே தெருவுடைய சாரி இருக்க முடியும் அதோடு வீட்டுக்குள்ளே வந்திருக்கிறாங்க மண்ணில் அது ஊற்றி கொடுத்துட்டாங்க எங்களுக்கு டெண்டு வீடும் கொடுக்க மாட்டேங்களாடா டெண்டில் கூட எங்களை இருக்க விட மாட்டேங்களா நாங்கள் எங்கே போய் இருக்கிறது அப்படின்னு மண்ணை கொளுத்திக்கிட்டாங்களோ நீங்கள் செத்தா மனைனை ஒரு தான் கொளுத்திக்க போகிறோம் நாங்கள் தே நீங்கள் செத்தா எங்களுக்கு என்ன நீங்கள் சாவுங்க அப்படின்னு டெண்டு வாங்கினோம் சொன்னானோம் இன்னும் கொடுக்கவே இல்லை சொன்னாங்க அங்கே எங்கள் வீட்டுக்காரங்க செத்த அன்னைக்கு சாவி தரோம் அவங்களுக்கு உதவி பண்ணுறோம் அது செய்கிறோம் இது செய்கிறோன்னு சொன்னாங்க இது வரலையே அவங்க மாதம் கணக்கு மூணு மாதம் ஆகிடுச்சு நாலு கணக்கு நாற்பத்தி ஒரு நாள் ஆகுது எங்களை என்னன்னு யாருமே வந்து பார்க்கறதில்ல இப்படி உங்களை மாதிரி வராங்க பேட்டி எடுக்கிறாங்க போகிறாங்க அது வரலையே எங்கே சாப்பிட்டிங்களா அவங்களுக்கு எந்த உதவி யார் உங்களுக்கு உழைச்சி போகிறோம் அவங்களே செத்து போயிட்டாங்க எப்படி சாப்பிட்றீங்க எங்களை கேட்குறது சொந்தம்னா எங்களுக்கு யாரும் இல்லை என் புருஷன் தான் எனக்கு சொந்தம் எனக்கு அண்ணன் தம்பி கூட இல்லை நான் ஒரு வயசு பிள்ளையில் எங்கள் அப்பா விட்டுட்டு செத்து போயிட்டார் ஒரு ரூபா எங்களுக்கு கொடுக்கல சார் சாப்பிட்டீங்களா கூட எங்களை கேவர்மெண்ட் கேட்கல வால் திஸ் ஃபிலிம் வாஸ் பீங் எடிட்டட் முனியம்மா காட் அ ஹவுஸ் பட் ஹர் லாஸ் வாஸ் ஃபார் கிரேட்டர் Right from the early days of rehabilitation, coastal people in many places found officials coming in a hurry, persuading them to leave the coasts. In the tsunami, we were in the first place. We were in the first place of the tsunami. We were in the first place of the tsunami. We were in the first place of the tsunami. We were in the first place of the tsunami. Now, we were in the first place of the tsunami. ஆயிரத்தி முந்நூற்றி தொண்ணூற்றி ரெண்டு வீடு கட்டியிருக்காங்க அந்த வீட்டில் ஆயிரத்தி எழுநூத்தி நாற்பத்தஞ்சு குடும்பத்துக்கு என்ன வழின்னு கேட்டாக்கா இதுக்கு மேலே நாங்கள் கட்டித்தரோம் ஆனால் இதுவரைக்கும் அந்த ஜனங்களுக்கு வீடே கிடைக்கல செவ்ரல் சுனாமி எஃபெக்டட் பீப்புள் கம்ப்ளைண்ட் அட் த பீப்புள்ஸ் ட்ரைபியூனல் ஆர்கனைஸ்ட் பை த வாய்ஸஸ் ஃப்ரம் த மார்ஜின்ஸ் இன் டிசம்பர் டூ தௌசண்ட் செவன் தட் அஃபிஷியல்ஸ் ஷிஃப்ட் தம் or made them sign documents that showed their willingness to shift all on a short notice without proper consultation or explanation அந்த பூச்சி கிடைச்சி என் மாவுக்கு இந்த உடம்புல கடிச்சு மூச்சு பயங்கரமா 
In coastal village of Srinivasapuram, people living in concrete flats built during the 1970s found their houses damaged in the tsunami. But the government refuses to repair or rebuild them. The houses are collapsing now, but they are not part of tsunami rebuilding. <laughs> அடிப்பட்டுச்சு <laughs> நாங்கள் டெய்லியும் கடலுக்கு போய்ட்டு வந்தால் வீட்டுக்கு வர சில வீட்டில் இருக்கிற குழந்தைங்க பொண்டாட்டிங்க உயிரை இருக்கிறாங்களா நம்பிக்கை இல்லாத நாங்கள் டெய்லியும் போய்ட்டு வரோம் சம்பாதிச்சு சாப்பிட்றது வேறு விஷயமா இருக்குது நாங்கள் உயிரை காப்பாற்றிக்க எங்களுக்கு உயிர் பயமாக இருக்குது கவர்மெண்ட்டு எதுவும் கேட்க மாட்டுறாங்க கேட்டு எந்த முடிவும் செய்ய மாட்டுறாங்க நாங்கள் எல்லாம் கடலோரத்தில் தான் படுக்கிறோம் வீட்டில் படுக்க சொல்ல வந்து நாங்கள் தொழில் போச்சு தான் வீட்டில் விட்டு போகிறோம் இந்த நேரத்தில் எல்லாம் கடலோரத்தில் தான் படுக்கிறோம் பொம்பளைங்க குட்டிங்க பிள்ளைங்க எல்லாமே வர சொல்ல தான் அங்கே வந்து பயத்தில் தான் வரும் டெய்லி சுனாமி நடக்கிற மாதிரி நடக்குது இது ஒண்ணு <laughs> Chennai the only problem is identification of the list of beneficiaries for the fishers of course these houses have to be demolished and reconstructed that process is going on so only when it is completed no the process of identification of beneficiaries then the work can start activists find that the government is quietly pushing an agenda to free up the coast in the process fisher people lost their traditional land rights and they are, and also they lost their access to livelihood in many places the state stayed very silent though many people say that the state did some tamil nadu state took a lot of initiative i think overall the state initiative was very simple use disaster to involve ngos to move people out from their traditional homeland and most ngos succumb to it so today if you walk along the beach you can see that many homelands many settlements that were there of the beach of the fishing community is removed already many of them have been given issued notice to move out activists question the government claims that land is in short supply for the disaster affected people they say that the ground reality is different but when it comes to uh, procuring land for poor people they they don't have that voice and and uh, unfortunately ngos also are not contributing to uh, organizing these people to get a voice yeah? and and we accept whatever is given instead of uh, using the existing land they went for a uh, hunt for a land uh, land site search and finally end up ended up in a uh, places which are almost 7 kilometers 5 kilometers 2 kilometers away from the coast for the fisher folk The coast is not just a few square feet of prime land it is a support system a culture a living environment <laughs> Displacement of coastal communities robs people of their livelihood If you go to any fishing village you can find the fishers will be playing cards You will think that simply that they are playing cards and having but by playing cards they will be having an eye on the sea they know the conditions of the sea even without playing sea also they'll be simply sitting in the coast and watching the sea watching the sea is the most important duty of any fisherman because once the wave condition is changing it is very conductive for fishing immediately they'll call people and go in and venture into the sea access to the sea that these fishing people have today is they have to either leave their nets on the sea shore which is creating new conflicts leave the boats there and then walk this is again not to talk about the immense difficulty women 
especially women vendors, women in auctioning, will have to face because of movement of them away from their sea coast. It was not always negligence. Delays in rehabilitation also happened by design. People like me are suspecting that uh, the process of elimination and displacement of fishing communities along the coastal area is an international design done by international financial institutions and the internet, big non-governmental organizations and local government. With these three forces have worked effectively to displace slowly fisher people from the coast. Aggression by the international agencies and the government is complete and they use tsunami as a tool to aggressively eliminate and alienate and displace the fisher people from the coast. And this process, they have done it in a very successful manner. But several villages have survived. They have succeeded in their design to displace people from the coast. There are constructions and development projects that deny the fishermen free access to the sea. Like this, several mile long, 10 meter high seawall constructed in Karikal. The wall has broken the relationship of the fishing community with the sea. Denied a livelihood. Some of the survivors have resorted to desperate measures. There have been reported cases of impoverished survivors selling their kidney. Tsunami in Allah, Yangala government. Where I did not say the Panir and Kilometer Kandapaka going to Porta than Allah, Varme in Sulnalea, Yanga Jananga Elarme, Kitney Kurtukuda, Walkin Arthakudia or Avalan Lake Talapatranga. Either against Yerna or Tsunami in the Layer in the Varagan Nupatina Liber, Kitney Kurtranga, Adal and Nupatir and Pengal, Yerenda Angal. Why are fisher folk being made to shift? Some experts see it as part of the global neoliberal agenda to commercialize the coast. Many believe that NGOs played into the hands of the government in this game. If you were to follow strictly what the government said, you might end up building houses, but people will not have anything to eat. If you win CZM, you notify the entire stretch from Injambagam to Mahabalipuram as a tourism area. So you don't even have to enter the city, your tourism is separate and then you hand the whole thing over to hotels. This is the plan. All those who are on the seafront have been moved and houses have been built by big global NGOs. It's very clearly planned the type of land that was given to these fishing communities for their homes was to make it sure, here is it we are showing you, you're supposed to be safe and the whole scare was tsunami will come anytime. This is simple cultural scare is which the state built on the people. The coastal land is subject to many commercial interests, so the market imperative is to free up the coast. The tsunami came as a blessing to these interests. The Chinese often say that every disaster is also an opportunity, but an opportunity for whom? So the efforts are needed to ensure that an opportunity is to rebuild the communities and an opportunity is for the people and the communities rather than for the private contractors and other commercial interests. And that is completely unacceptable. Tsunami was used by the state and other global interests, commercial interests, because they needed those lands. Much of those lands were not on the world market, were not on the market itself. And now they've decided that these lands must get onto the market. It must become real estate. When Fisher for Community said, we want to build houses, within the 500 meters itself. It was a big challenge for us. The challenge because there were government regulations which said that you cannot rebuild houses within 500 meters. If you build houses within 500 meters, the government is not going to give any contribution. So here comes the government saying that, look, this is how we will do it. So you, you have an option either to do exactly what the government is telling you, which will kick the communities out, or with, go with the communities, but provide the minimum support. The government is very clear that all along the coast, wherever there are uh, Kacha, that is hutments, you know, not proper houses, people must move. If there are households and they're giving them the option, you can move. This is the house built for you. 
If houses have been built already, the state is saying you must move. There is no way out. We are not going to continue to give you any title deeds here. So what they're doing now is allowing projects to start taking place on either side of the villages. So you have the forest department taking over land, saying this is my land on one side of the village. And you have another project coming up, either a harbor or an uh, energy power project or something coming up on the other side of the village. So you close in on these people. So they'll have, be, they'll have nothing left, they just have to be, they'll be pushed out. Ironically, the resolve on part of the government to find land and, and uh, promote a CZ and industries is much, much higher than compared to rehabilitating people. The state's job is to enable, to create the conditions or to enable the people through various means, either through a very sound rehabilitation package or a compensation package, to enable people to restore together with themselves as a community wherever they were staying when the disaster took place. Movement of people away from where the disaster took place is no answer and in fact creates a whole realm of new social relationships, many of them very violent social relationships, which the com both the communities, the community that have accepted them into that new social relationship and the community that has moved into that new social relationship, do not know how to manage. And there is no NGO who can help them in that process, no state who can help them in that process. Besides, there were problems in construction itself. INGOs are NGOs who are involved, who did the major part of the rehabilitation, never understood the actual needs of the people and actual kind of houses that they need and uh, actual kind of uh, rehabilitation which they need. Many of the new houses constructed across Tamil Nadu is a total failure in terms of construction. More than 50 percentage of the houses are not properly constructed with the technical guidance provided by the government of Tamil Nadu in terms of the width of the beam, the size of the steel inside the houses and the plinth area. So many instructions were accepted by the INGOs involved, by the, involved in the construction of houses and the government in terms of technical guidance. And that technical guidance was totally neglected in the process of construction. Rehabilitation is indeed an opportunity to take care of all aspects of the lives of the affected people, their livelihood, lifestyles, rights and culture. But the NGOs and the government seem to have missed this chance. Shelter is an excellent opportunity not just to put a roof over people's heads. It's also an, ex it's an opportunity to rebuild the communities, strengthen their hands, and advance the issue of rights within community. Compared to many other places, in Tamil Nadu, the pace of construction is much faster. But although I don't s share the same compliment for the quality of construction. And if you look at the quality of housing that was built by NGOs, some of them look very good, I mean, outside. But inside, if you go and see the cracks, you know, numerous places we went to, at least we traveled to about seven, eight places, all of them had deep cracks in the ceiling, there were cracks, uh, no sanitation, no drainage pipes. So what do they do with those toilets? They still make no use. And even if they do, it's so low-lying that it's constantly flooded, the toilet is flooded. Permanent houses uh, in Tamil Nadu, what we have seen, uh, the type of houses which we are building are not the usual uh, government built houses. Normally it will be around 200 square feet with, uh, usually they will cost about 40,000 to 50,000 rupees. But the houses we have been building uh, in Tamil Nadu after tsunami, these houses are 325 square feet and they are uh, having disaster resistant features. That is, they can withstand uh, future earthquakes, future tsunamis also. And these houses uh, take a little more time to construct because they need to have uh, uh, bands at various levels, at the basement, at the plinth level, at the lintel level, etc. And these houses are under construction with stairs and other things. Here is a rehabilitation site 
where a series of houses were built on loose sand without even the most basic foundation structures. Contract work is done in the contract. ஒழுங்கான பேஸ்மெண்ட் வந்து ஒழுங்காவே இல்லை ஃபவுண்டேஷன் எதுவுமே ஒழுங்காக இல்லை மழை பெஞ்சுட்டு இருக்கும்போது வந்து அந்த கட்டிகிட்டு இருக்கும்போது நல்ல மழை நல்ல மழையில் பார்த்தோம் அப்படின்னா ஃபவுண்டேஷன் இப்படி தூக்கிட்டு தான் நின்றுது ஸோ அதில் உடைய ரீகன்ஸ்ட்ரக்ஷன் எதுவுமே பண்ணாமல் அப்படியே அந்த அதே என்ன ஃபவுண்டேஷன் போட்டாங்களோ அதுலேருந்தே பில்டிங்கை கட்டி முடிச்சாச்சு இப்போ கட்டி முடித்து ஒன் வீக்கில் நல்ல ஒரு வீடு கொடுத்துட்டு வந்து ஒரு ஒரு மாதத்துக்குள்ளே நல்ல மழை பெஞ்சுது நல்ல மழை பெய்யும் போது மேலே இருந்து அப்படியே தண்ணி உள்ளே கொட்டி திரும்பியும் மக்கள் போயிட்டு அதே நிறுவனத்துக்கிட்ட கம்ப்ளைண்ட் பண்ணதுனால அவங்க வந்து கொஞ்சம் ஏதோ ரிப்பேரிங் ஒர்க் மட்டும் பண்ணிட்டு போயிருக்காங்க காத்து பலமாக அடிச்சா ஷேக்கிங் இருக்கு இன்னமும் மழை பெஞ்சுதுன்னா ஒழுகிறது அந்த தண்ணி வடியிறது மட்டும் இருந்துகிட்டு இருக்கு அப்படின்னு ஈரம் தாங்குது அந்த தழத்து கீழே இருந்து அப்படியே ஈரம் தாங்குது எங்களுக்கு பயமா இருக்குது காத்து நிறைய காத்து அடிச்சா கூட பயமா இருக்கு அங்கே அது வீட்டில் இருக்குது த ஹவுசஸ் ஆஃப் வாய்ஸ் ஒன்ஸ் ஆர் பில்ட் ஆன் த ராக் செஸ் த பைபிள் அண்ட் த ரெயின் டிசெண்டட் த ஃப்ளட்ஸ் கேம் அண்ட் த விண்ட்ஸ் ப்ளூ அண்ட் பீட் ஆன் தட் ஹவுஸ் and it did not fall for it was founded on the rock a foolish man built his house on the sand and the rain descended the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it fell and great was its fall even international groups have acknowledged that there have been lapses in housing the failure is reported not by groups like us it was reported by UNDP United Nations Development Program has done a mid term housing on mid term assessment on housing they have repeatedly stressed the failures in terms of quality of the construction in all the housings which are constructed in Tamil Nadu UN rapporteur for housing has also come out with a uh, clear criticism against the process of construction in terms of lack of quality in terms of displacement of the people in terms of lack of access to their livelihood in terms of gender sensitiveness to the entire construction process even in this gloomy scenario there have been some rehabilitation attempts that give reason for optimism over weed in velai nadangum anaitha naatkalilum ஒவ்வொரு வீட்டிலிருந்தும் அந்த பயனாளிகளிலிருந்து நிச்சயம் ஒருவர் அந்த வீட்டு வேலை நடக்கும் இடத்தில் இருப்பார் அதன் மூலம் அவர்களுக்கு தரமான வீடுகள் அவர்களுக்கு கிடைப்பது அவர்களுக்கு அவர்களே உறுதி செய்ய கொள்ளக்கூடிய ஒரு வாய்ப்பாகவும் அது அமைந்திருக்கிறது அனைத்து வசதிகளையும் அவர்களுக்கு செய்து கொடுத்திருக்கிறோம் சாலை வசதிகள் இல்லாத இடத்தில் சாலைகள் அமைக்கவும் மேலும் அந்த பகுதியில் அவர்கள் தாங்களாகவே மரங்களை நட்டு அந்த ஒரு பகுதியை ஒரு சோலைவனமாக மாற்றக்கூடிய அளவிலே அவர்களும் செய்து கொண்டிருக்கிறார்கள் people have different needs and aspirations the challenge is whether rehabilitation can take into account these factors creatively and effectively the shelter has to be habitable hmm? people should be able to feel comfortable there hmm? uh, in terms of heat humidity uh, uh, maintaining their cultural practices hmm? uh, maintaining their day to day life that's habitability and that habitability also has to go up let people decide what kind of house they want can we get their aspirations mapped out we are not making palaces for them but at least make functional houses which in which they can grow in which they can perform their basic livelihood activities whatever livelihood activities they have women should be able to cook safely and feel secure in that home and when it rains it shouldn't flood that area there are, there are so many things which we can do well without spending too much resources mistakes were not limited to construction they spilled over to the socio economic realm as well because we did not go with adequate knowledge of socio cultural fabric of the communities with whom we are working involuntarily we have definitely caused deep damage to the relationships and equalities uh, there i don't think that we have anywhere reduced inequalities it's a general statement there are exceptions on an average we did not really reduce inequalities rather 
we've actually intensified existing inequalities by creating new wealth in new pockets and in some places we created new inequalities one area where we have not been able to alter inequalities is definitely gender relationships if at all we have actually intensified unequal position of women who have always been suffered second class citizen status there are many instances where our gender studies have shown the new rich aged grooms have been able to marry under age poor girls from the communities because they have wealth this is one example of how we have actually created more vulnerable situations for young girls and women there have also been examples where women who have lost husbands and got compensation have been forced to marry out of their choice with the communities because they have money and created new repercussions for the society for simple reason because we have gone there without understanding the local situation and we with our money power we have altered we have deeply damaged the socio cultural fabric the minimum standards in shelter are all about the most basic prerequisites to ensure life livelihood and dignity of the disaster affected people shelter and settlement come under the ambit of international human rights law fair standards uh, is a uh, great tool to uh, and an integrated knowledge it is it is a great decision making tool uh, planning tool so very initially you can plan your provision of services using um, the indicators of fair standards standards uh, are to be achieved uh, certain quality standards are to be achieved fair gives you Uh, lots of quantitative indicators to measure whether you have reached those standards or not rehabilitation becomes more complex because there is a conflict of interests among communities ngos and the government what we have learned over the years is that there is a smart way of making your effort uh, achieve its objectives and be successful you cannot uh, give appeal to someone who need a banana you better ask what what they want and you bring what they want At the heart of every rehabilitation process should be efforts to build resilience of communities against future disasters. But did that happen? Tsunami was the moon was a year ago. When I gave Sumar, Arvara and Gordi Rumaki Mala on the Matya Mala Rasi Vandra. This is the one that 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 the one கடலோர சமூகங்களை வளப்படுத்துவதற்காக கொண்டு வந்த பணங்கள் நீ வந்து கடலோரத்துக்கு சம்பந்தம் இல்லாத இடங்களை வந்து வளப்படுத்துவதற்கு பண்ணிட்டுருக்காங்க பிசைட்ஸ் கல்ச்சுரல் ஃபேக்டர்ஸ் ஆர் ஆஃபன் நெக்லெக்டட் வால் ரீபில்டிங் ஹவுசிங் இஸ் கல்ச்சர் ஹவுசிங் இஸ் சிவிலைசேஷன் ஹவுசிங் இஸ் லைவ்லிஹுட் இஃப் யூ பட் த ஸ்டேட் டசன் சீ தட் வே ஸ்டேட் சீஸ் இட் அஸ் அ ஃபோர் வால்ஸ் இன் அ ரூஃப் ஃபார் கான்ட்ராக்டர்ஸ் அண்ட் சீஸ் வேர் எவர் யூ ஆர் த்ரோன் அவுட் as open space for the market which it can give out as doles to big industries and collect their suitcases and this is exactly what the ngo is doing because they are within the same state framework they are not an anti privatization framework or an anti globalization framework so they just seen this as adding they got more jeeps they got more computers they got buildings they build their own houses you've got to spend this money boss this money is lying there we've got millions for you so it was a rat race for the millions of rupees that's all and now they didn't give up now comes post reconstruction money you're supposed to take on a long term project of 3 to 5 years with the balance money you know because you can't tell the people you took the money there that look it's all over people are happy with their livelihood so you have to tell them no we are with those people again people are saying get out leave us alone you so you've created hell with our lives just leave us alone you've created disaster you divided us but ngos don't give up so easily to engage people if you put the communities at the center stage in designing deciding and implementing a relief and rehabilitation program you can get really good results plans cannot be made by the planning commission or a few ministries sitting in delhi the plans has to be made sitting and with the communities and with their active involvement and consultation there are international players involved and their agendas come in the way of meaningful rehabilitation everybody admits it though in a different language 
We have not allowed the NGOs to do whatever they pleased. ADP is involved in this livelihood, etc., which I mentioned, the bridges and all that. Okay. World Bank is involved in the center belt. Okay. This uh, tsunami housing in Chennai is funded by them. This rehabilitation package which they got from World Bank is not just housing. Housing is one component. It has a lot of infrastructure components. So what the state is doing is it's building using all its money maximum for providing flyovers, new roads. The state is not on the side of the people anymore. And if people believe that it was ever, I mean, it was never on the side, but what little it was on the side is all over. We failed to make this government work towards addressing the issues. Actually, the relief and rehabilitation is fundamentally the role of government. Where civil society can come and support the government. But in tsunami rehabilitation, it became the role of the NGOs and government was doing a backseat work rather than leading the rehabilitation in the front. Out of 53,000 houses, 31,000 are by the NGOs and 22 by the government. Shisha people feel the rehabilitation process is uh, something which is taking place away from them rather than among them. The major component of the relief and rehabilitation process took place like housing. It was carried out by majority of the relief agencies without the complete consensus and participation of the Fisher people. All said and done, any relief or rehabilitation should primarily be appropriate assistance for the appropriate people at the appropriate time. And to ensure this, you need to really put communities at the center stage. Investing in disaster risk reduction often yields 10 times better results. So, but you don't talk about investing in disaster risk reduction just after a disaster has happened. You need to invest in advance. Humanitarian agencies are not able to do because in order to do that we need sufficient funds and the donors are not willing to provide funds for that kind of a risk reduction and prevention and preparedness activity. There is little money available for that kind of activities. Lot of money comes more than what we want for response but we don't get enough money for preparedness and grooming and creating human resources kind of. But the government can do it. But government sadly lacks that perspective. And disaster risk reduction should be a part of the ongoing process. So it means that you are not integrating disaster risk reduction only into relief and rehabilitation. You are actually integrating and you need to integrate this into the development processes. The lessons learnt and efficiency that the yeah, Andhra Pradesh government has achieved in responding to floods and cyclones is not transferred to the neighboring state of Orissa or maybe Karnataka. If Karnataka has to face a major super cyclone like Andhra and Orissa have faced, they have to start from the scratch. It happens mainly because there is no sense of accountability felt at the government level that disasters are an important portfolio of governance. For the government, it becomes now crucial and mandatory to take up disaster risk reduction because the governments have signed up to the Hyogo Framework for Action and which says very clearly that governments must make investment into disaster risk reduction. One very very important lesson is that disaster response and disaster management is not a one-time issue. It is a day-to-day -day effort. It is part of our life.